Today's scripture comes from Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 24, the Common English Bible. Stop collecting treasures for your own benefit on earth, where moth and rust eat them, and where thieves break in and steal them. Instead, collect treasures for yourself in heaven, where moth and rust don't eat them, and where thieves don't break in and steal them. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. Therefore, if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how terrible that darkness will be. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be loyal to the one and have contempt for the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. So ends the reading of God's holy word. I hope everybody is doing well today. Um, boy, I hope this message isn't just about me today. I hope that it touches other people. Um, Brett has been with me. Uh, he's not here today. It's not because the message is so bad, by the way. <laughs> he's at a family reunion still. Um, but I've been going through this change. I don't know if it happens when you hit 45, but here I am. And um, the things that I wanted when I was younger are different than the things I wanted today, if anybody can relate to that. So let's start out with a video. See a private island view with a table for two, she said. I love the way that you do what you do, what you do. Make me do what you do, what you do, what you do. I love the way that you do what you do, what you do. Make me do what you do, what you do, what you do. Front, back, side, side. Front, front, back, back, side, side. Now move it front, back, side, side. Front, front, back, back, side, side. Now move it up. I like that. Soul, a new way to roll. So does anybody here feel like sometimes they're a hamster on a wheel? Yeah, I know that I do. And I know that I've been feeling like a really, really tired hamster lately. And I've begun to wonder how I got to the point of not really enjoying my life. I have a great life, don't get me wrong. I have a better life than I could have ever imagined having, a better life than I ever could have written. But I find myself running from event to event in life and not enjoying the moment I'm living in. Stuff in life keeps getting in the way of me living my life. I'm buried in work Monday through Friday and then at 5 o'clock on Friday, I give this big sigh of relief because I'm done. And then I realize that I have a to-do list for the weekend. And I need to mow and I need to clean and I need to figure out if there's anything I need to do for church. And I rush to get all of that done. And then for a couple of hours after church and after worship team on Sunday night, I sit on the sofa and I think, okay, I made it through this weekend but I still have to do stuff to do on my list and I hardly have any time to relax before I start a new week all over again. And I think, okay, I can get through this upcoming week. Maybe, maybe I can breathe this week. Maybe I'll find time to relax. Maybe I'll be enough this week. Maybe this week I'll be smarter than I was last week. Maybe I'll be better spoken. Maybe I'll lose a few pounds. And I assure myself that this week is going to be a good week and it's going to be better. And then I think everything that's on my to-do list 
is going to get done this week. And I realize that I'm marking my time by all the things that I don't accomplish. How has my life become me running on a hamster wheel, running around and around? Who put me on that wheel? I thought about this for like months. <laughs> I'm a slow learner, really slow runner. And then it hit me that I'm the person that put me on that wheel. God didn't put me there. I put myself right where I'm at. And lately I've thought about all the things that stress me out. And my stress isn't something that God gave me either. My stress comes from the choices that I made. I'm so stressed out because I stressed myself out. I'm the one doing this. Being, a hamster, being on a hamster wheel can't ever be relaxing. You're always running, your heart is always pounding, your eyes are always focused straight ahead, and you never can look around you to see what's going on around you. It's a really self-centered, lonely life. When you're on a hamster wheel, you can't see where you've been or if there was any impact to anything that you've done. You're running a never-ending race with no awareness of where you're at in the race. Why do we do this? I began to think about Jesus' life. Did he ever feel this way? I don't think he did. I think about the things that I say or the things that I think, and I realize that Jesus would never say them. For example, I am sure that he never stood in his closet. Side note, I don't think he had a closet. And I don't think he stood there and wished for a better selection of shoes. I think he put on the one pair of sandals he happened to own at that time, and I think he had it on down the road. One pair of shoes at a time is all the Lord the maker of heaven and earth, that's all he needed. And I got to thinking this week as I sat on a beach with the kids on Friday that I don't need a whole bunch of pair of shoes because the most fun I have in life is always barefoot, right? And I am sure that Jesus never thought I need to get a bigger house or that he thought I should get a storage unit so that I could keep my extra stuff there and then my house would look decluttered. Jesus didn't clutter up his heart with the things of this world. He trusted that his Father would provide. And there's proof of that in the Lord's Prayer we just said together. And the Lord's Prayer is found in Matthew. He said, give us this day our daily bread. Jesus trusted that his Father would take care of him. And Jesus also taught us that God is our Father too. He says, our Father, instead of my Father. Jesus trusted that his Father would care for him. And he will care for us. He assures us that that is true. But do we trust? I don't know. I don't think that I have just enough food in our pantry for today. I think that I have enough food in the freezer in the pantry for probably a month and a half. And yet when I've been working all day and I come home, I look in the freezer in the pantry and there is nothing to eat. And of course we run out, we get a quick bite. I don't know what that means, the quick bite. Like it makes it okay to have left the house with a pantry full of, of food. We're never satisfied with what we have. As people, we're always looking to ensure that we have more than we need. So I started reading a book, and it's this one. It's the Gospel of Matthew with us by Matt Woodley. And it's from a set of books called the Resonance Series. And it has different authors 
who give their different interpretations on the books of the Bible. And this particular book dissects the book of Matthew. And it gives um, a current perspective on today. So it, it takes every page, every verse, and it breaks it down on, on how we see things today. And again, that's proof that the Bible is relevant today. And I haven't completely finished the book, but I continue to turn over pages and put stick it notes in it so that I can go back and, and read it later. But on page 85, it really hit home to me, and I want to read you a portion of that. Stuff. You name it. Shoes, books, frying pans, necklaces, power tools, dresses, blue jeans, laptops, and cars. We crave it. And once we get it, we hoard it. And as a nation, we're masters of storing our stuff. The United States now has 2.3 billion square feet of self-storage space. And I looked, this book was written in 2011, so I'm sure it's more. I know, they just built some new ones down there and I rented one. <laughs> and this is all from an article in the New York Times Magazine and um, the information is from the Self Storage Association. But what's interesting is it's now physically possible that every American can all stand at the same time under the total canopy of self-storage roofing. That's a big roof. Oh, how we crave stuff. Rodney Clapp contends that this insatiability is a hallmark of the consumer. The consumer is tutored that people basically consist of unmet needs that can be appeased by goods and experiences. Accordingly, the consumer should, should think first and foremost of him or herself and meeting his or her needs. So when we don't get the stuff we want, we churn with discontentment. And when we get the right stuff, we want to protect it. With or without stuff, we think about it, worry about it, and end up trapped by it. In the end, stuff possesses us, plunging us into a pit of anxiety and misery. So why do we put such a focus on stuff and getting better stuff and, and who has the best stuff? With our need for stuff comes our obsession for money. The more money we have, the more stuff we can buy. So to get better stuff, we need to get bigger and better jobs, and with those jobs comes stress, and with the stress comes unsatisfaction, because more stuff just leads to needing more stuff and wanting more stuff. So just when we have everything we thought that we would need to be happy, something better comes along. We're back at the start again, trying to fill up our desire for better stuff, and then suddenly we're a hamster on a wheel, endlessly running with our hearts pounding out of our chest. And like I said earlier, then you wake up halfway through your life and you realize you only have half your life left, maybe. And you realize that you don't want to live your life the way you've been living your life up until now. Society tells us ambitious people work hard so that they can get really good stuff. And if we don't have really good stuff, then we must be lazy, right? That's what all the magazines and the TV shows and the internet, that's what they're telling us, isn't it? More stuff is proof that we're better. I don't want to live in the murky waters of wanting more and to thinking that I need more I want to live for the things that should be in my heart. I want my heart to be filled with the things that Jesus filled his heart with. He wasn't running on a hamster wheel of consumerism. His perspective was different. I think his perspective was closer to the perspective you would get from a Ferris wheel. You can look around, you get a better view. 
almost a 365 degree perspective if you move your head. The wind gently blowing against his face. Arms in the air reaching to heaven with love in his heart. Jesus might have reached out and touched the heaven and pulled some of that love down from the sky. He walked here. He's lived with humanity. And when he was here, he saw that we would be obsessed with having more. That we would be prone to be obsessed with having everything. And when we fill up our hearts and our minds with the distractions of this world, we don't fare so well. Jesus' heart and his mind was set on love and loving others. He spent his day as a healer of hearts, minds, and souls. He sought after the brokenhearted. He shared with them all that would listen about his teachings and about the love of his Father. When was the last time you sought out a brokenhearted person or talked to the less fortunate or found a hard-to-reach soul? When we're in our own little world, running on our own little hamster wheel, we miss all the opportunities that God gives us to be his hands and feet here on earth. We stay safe inside our wheel, far from anything that can tip it over. And we hold on to the things of this world that seem far safer and a better use of our time. We want to get out of our time something that we can hold in our hands instead of the moments that we can hold in our heart. Yet somehow living this way fills up our hearts and we become hoarders of contentment and selfishness. I'd like to share with you a, a post from a friend on Facebook. An old Cherokee is teaching his grandson about life. He says, a fight is going on inside me. It's a terrible fight, and it's between two wolves. One is evil. He's angry, envious, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, and ego. And he continues, the other is good. He is joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, empathy, generosity, trust, compassion, and faith. The same fight is going on inside of you and inside of every other person too. And the grandson thought about it for a moment. And then he asked his grandfather, which wolf will win? And the old Cherokee simply replied, the one you feed. The one we feed wins. Christ saw this when he walked with us 2,000 years ago. And today we continue to feed the wrong hunger. So I want to read to you today our scripture again, but this time I'm going to read it from the message, and I'm going to read it all the way to the end of the chapter. So Matthew 6, 19 through 36, and I want to share with you. Stacy, you might not know you always make a difference, but you do. I never owned the Bible as the message, and we stand up here and we tell everybody all the time, read the whole Bible, right? I've read the whole Bible, and there's a whole bunch of it in there that I didn't understand, but thank goodness I could turn the page. But I think that when you read the message, when you would attend worship team, and she would read the same chapters that I was reading in the King James Version in the message, it was always like, oh wow, there's just this complete understanding. It makes sense. The King James Version isn't meant to be hard, or whatever version you're reading. But the King James Version, it was written in the language that was spoken at that time. It wasn't fancy language, it was just the regular speak, right? So the message simply takes the Bible and writes it in our regular speak today. So if you really want to read the Bible and you don't know how to start, um, pick up the message and start there. So here we go. <coughs> 
Verse 19, chapter 6. Don't hoard treasures down here where it gets eaten by moss and corrupted by rust or worst, stolen by burglars. Stockpile treasures in heaven. That's where it's safe from moss and rust and burglars. It's obvious, isn't it? The place where your treasure is is the place you will most want to be and end up being. Your eyes are light into your body. If you open your eyes in wonder and belief, your body fills up with light. And you live squinty-eyed in greed and distrust. Your body is in a dank cellar. If you pull the blinds on your windows, what a dark life you will have. You can't worship two gods at once. Loving one, you'll end up hating the other. Adoration of one feeds contempt for the other. We can't worship God and money both. If you decide for God, live a life of God worship. It follows that you won't fuss about on what's on the table at mealtime or whether the clothes in your closet are in fashion. There is far more to your life than the food you put in your stomach, more to your outer appearance than the clothes that you hang on your body. Look at the birds, free and unfettered, not tied down by a job description, careless in the care of God. You count far more to him than those birds. Has anyone, by fussing in front of a mirror, ever, ever gotten an inch taller? All this time and money wasted on fashion, do you think that it makes that much of a difference? Instead of looking at fashion, walk out into the fields and look at the wildflowers. They never primp or shop, but have you ever seen color and design quite like it? The 10 best dressed men and women in this country look shabby alongside them. If God gives such attention to the appearance of wildflowers, much of which will never be seen, don't you think he'll attend to you, take pride in you, do his best for you? What I'm trying to do here is to get you to relax. It's not to be preoccupied with getting so that you can respond to God's giving. People who don't know God and the works that he does fuss over these things, but you know both God and how he works. Steep your life in God reality and God initiative and God provision. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human needs will be met. Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now and don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. So ends the reading of the message. And I also want to share with you from the book I'm reading that again is Matthew. And this is what it says. There is room in our hearts for multiple loves. However, there is room for only one treasure. Because Jesus is for us, he wants us to have the right treasure. God in his kingdom. If anything usurps God's rightful place as our true treasure, we're in trouble. And eventually everything with lesser value will disappear. No one can serve two masters. Jesus wants to save us from the pain of living with a divided heart. So I'm working on getting off the hamster wheel and climbing onto a Ferris wheel. I need to always be asking myself, is, me, is this me wanting this or is me, this me needing this? No more pounding heart or sweaty brows for the things of this world. I want to live careless in the care of God. Here's my heart, Lord. Fill it up with the treasures of your love. Amen. Amen. Could the ushers come forward?